Hello everyone, I'm Norman Wahlberger. In this video, we are going to present a solution to this famous mathematical problem, that any quadrilateral is the perspective image of a square. So we've been preparing for that by reviewing some interesting and uh, important topics in projective geometry. And today we're going to present a solution. And the solution I'm going to present is due to uh, three mathematicians, Annalisa Crenell, Mark France, and Fukimo Futamara. The paper is The Image of a Square, which appeared in 2017 in the monthly, and we're going to be following their construction. At the end of the video, I'm going to point out, uh, I think, an important additional direction that we should think about. So the problem is not going to end exactly here, because there's going to be some important issues that we have to touch base with that I think will be of quite uh, general interest. Now the problem involves uh, not only the notion of perspectivity but also the idea of the square. The idea of a square really belongs a little bit more to affine geometry than it does to projective geometry. And implicit in that is a notion of perpendicularity. So here is a square. Now what actually makes it a square? Well, first of all, it's a quadrilateral, so it has four vertices, four sides, and the adjacent sides are perpendicular. So we have perpendicularity there, 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 and there. That, in fact, prescribes a rectangle. So a general quadrilateral with that property is a rectangle. What makes it a square is some additional perpendicularity which we can frame in terms of the diagonals of this rectangle. So if we draw the diagonals like this, then the property of being a square is the additional property that the diagonals themselves are perpendicular. So to frame this famous math problem, we really need to imbue our affine space, our three-dimensional space in which everything is happening, with a suitable notion of perpendicularity. Now geometrically, so without going into the algebraic side of things, perpendicularity is pretty well equivalent to having a circle and its center. So if we know that here is a circle and here is its center, then we basically have perpendicularity. And conversely, if we have perpendicularity, then we can create a circle uh, around a point. Let me explain that. So, here we start with a circle, and I want to convince you that that circle gives us a notion of perpendicularity. So one way of doing that is to observe that if we take a diameter of the circle, so a line passing through the center, say AB, then any triangle subtended by that in the circle will give us a right angle right there. So if C is any point on the circle, then the line AC is perpendicular to the line CB. And this is one of the very first theorems of, uh, of geometry, in fact, of mathematics. It's called Thales' theorem, and it's perhaps the second you know, most ancient and important theorem in mathematics after the uh, diagonal rule of the ancient Babylonians, otherwise known as Pythagoras' theorem. So given a circle, we get a notion of perpendicularity. So for example, if we wanted to know what line is perpendicular to that, we just would find that point there, and and then that would be the perpendicular line. Now, note that there's another connection with perpendicularity, because once we have a diameter, then the tangent to the circle at either of these two points is going to be perpendicular to this diameter, or to this radius. So that's another way that a circle determines perpendicularity. Conversely, if we have a notion of perpendicularity, then we can create a circle. So suppose we have a point O, we want that to be the center. We have a point A, which we're going to agree is on the circle. So how do we construct the circle through A centered at O? Well, traditionally this is done with the physical implementation of a compass. But if you were, say, working with a dynamical geometry package, you might not have a tool that does that. So a way of doing that, if you just have perpendicularity, is as follows. You take a line through the center, say L. Okay? And what you do is you reflect the point A in this line L to find the point B. 
What does that mean? Well, it means that you're going perpendicularly to L and you're going an equal amount so that that vector is the same as that vector. Okay, so crucially, we're using the perpendicularity there to reflect A to B. Now, as L moves around, the point B will rotate around the circle. So if we start with the line L here, B will be there. And as we move, this finger is B, um, it would go, go sort of something like this, it goes twice as fast. So by the time the line is there, we're to A. Okay, so this is a very important uh, idea that comes up in a lot of things. It's also connected with the rational parameterization of the circle because we basically associated points on the circle to lines through the center. Okay, so either way we see this strong connection between perpendicularity and circles and so not surprisingly the circle plays a role in the solution to this problem. Okay, so now I want to show you the solution. And I'm going to do that with this somewhat three-dimensional picture. Okay, so let's start and have a look at what we're, what we're talking about. So here is the quadrilateral that we're interested in. A, B, C, D. There's the quadrilateral. And it's in this plane here, the plane called pi. And we're trying to find a point of perspectivity, which we'll call P, so that when we project from P, to this quadrilateral, we get a square. Now, actually, what's going to happen is like this. This plane of pi will be, say, more or less horizontal. I still want you to be able to see it. Okay, something like this. And, um, and the point P is up here. And we're going to look at the perspectivity from P. That means we're thinking about lines emanating from P through these four points A, B, C, and D. Now, there's a third plane here. This is the plane sigma. And it's going to be, we're going to agree, that it's going to be parallel to this plane up here. So these two are parallel. So with a side view, something like that. Okay, they're parallel. Maybe they're parallel like this or like this. Okay, they're, they're parallel. Okay, and after we project from P through the points of the quadrilateral, the lines are going to meet this object plane in four points. A, say sigma, B, sigma, C, sigma, and D, sigma. Okay, so what that means is that if I kind of look from P, say through uh, C, that line there is going to come out underneath to that point there. B here, which is the closest to the front, uh, that point is going to be the top one here, and then there's A and the image of D. And what we want to claim is that this image here is actually a square. And if we can prove that, then we have solved the problem. Because then we can kind of reverse things and we can say, all right, if we start with this square and we take the perspective image of this square from the point P, then on this image plane, we are going to get the required quadrilateral A, B, C, D. Okay, so now I have to convince you that this thing here actually is a square. So let's have a look at a little bit here at the geometry of, of what's going on up here. So there's obviously some auxiliary points and, and, and so on, and uh, some, some circles as well. So I have to explain this diagram. Okay, so here is A, B, C, D, the original quadrilateral, and the sides B, C, and A, D meet at this point V, and the other sides A, B, and C, D meet at this point V prime. So we're going to think about this line as being the horizon of, the, of this, uh, this configuration. Now, the other points, W and W prime, are where the two diagonals, AC and BD, meet this horizon. So we have these four points on the horizon. And what do we know about those four points? Well, we know that uh, they form a harmonic range. There's a special relationship between the, the vectors uh, formed by these four points. And what that means is that the cross ratio of the four points is minus one. Okay? And geometrically what that means is that, say, V prime divides W W prime internally in the same ratio that V divides it externally. So what is this ratio to this ratio? Maybe it's sort of like three to two. 
okay? This is maybe a one and a half times that. So three to two. And what about this thing here? Well, this to this is also about three to two. Three to two, right? So that's the meaning of the being the uh, being a harmonic range cross ratio equals minus one. Now, where do these circles come from? Well, these circles are constructed to have diameters, first of all, v, v prime. So this circle here is a circle built on this diameter from v to v prime. And this circle here is the circle built on the diameter from w to w prime. And our point P, our point of perspectivity, is the meat of these two circles. Now, there, actually, there's another meat downstairs, but we don't care. Let's just use that one there. Okay, so now let's um, look at the consequences of the way we set things up in terms of the perspectivity from this quadrilateral to this quadrilateral. First of all, because these two planes are parallel, okay, this line here, that would be like the axis line, is going to be parallel to uh, this horizon or vanishing line. All right, so now let's have a look at the relationship between this quadrilateral and this image quadrilateral under this perspectivity from P. The first thing we're going to look at say, are these two sides of the quadrilateral, AD and BC. So the image can be the line through AD, or A sigma, D sigma, that line there, and this one here, this line here from B sigma to C sigma. Okay. Now, these two lines up here meet at the point V, and V happens to be in the plane of the board here, which is parallel, by agreement, to our object plane sigma. That means that the image of V under this perspectivity will actually not be a finite point. This line does not meet this plane in a finite point. But it does meet it at infinity because it represents the infinite direction. Okay. And what infinite direction is it? Well, it's just the direction that we get by taking that vector there and translating it to here. So you can see my diagram is not very good. Uh, this line here and this line here should actually be parallel, so it should be, they should be more uh, like this. This thing should be rotated a little bit over, okay. But um, the point is that this line and this line are going to meet at infinity because the image of their meet up here is on the line at infinity. And that tells us that this line and this line are actually parallel in this plane. Similarly, the line AB here and line CD here meet at this point, V prime, which again, its image is going to be at infinity in this plane. And that's telling us that the line from A sigma to B sigma and from C sigma to D sigma, these two sides are also going to be parallel. That proves that this object is a parallelogram. See? All right, so we've obtained that from uh, the fact, essentially, that V and V prime are um, in, this, uh, in this vanishing line. Okay, now, what about the perpendicular properties? So, let's have a look at the point P being on this circle. The fact that P is on this circle means that these two directions, this direction here and this direction here, are perpendicular. But this direction here is going to be the same as this direction here and same as this direction here. And this direction here is going to be the same as this direction here and this direction here. Because, for example, when you project V from P, you're getting the point which is, you know, infinitely in that direction. So it specifies this direction. When we translate that down to here, that's going to be, if I draw on this thing correctly, uh, the direction of these lines here. So these two lines here being perpendicular means that these lines here are perpendicular. This is perpendicular to that, this is perpendicular to that, etc. These two directions are perpendicular to these two directions because they're exactly the same as these two directions. Great. 
Okay, um, what else? Well, the other point is that P is on this circle. Now, this circle is a circle with diameter W, W prime, which is the meat of the diagonals here. Okay, what's that telling us? That means that if we're interested in the image of this diagonal, okay, so this is from B to D, that's, uh, that's that one there, that's the image of that thing there. And C, A, that one there, the image of that will be this thing here. Now, what we know is from P, if we look to the point W prime and we look to the point W, those are perpendicular directions. Perpendicular directions. So that means that the, the line BD over here, which gets sent to the line B sigma, D sigma there, that's going to be, that's a perpendicular direction to the line joining AC, its image, which is this one here. It's the same kind of exploitation of the fact that we have perpendicularity here and here. This direction and this direction are going to be the directions contained in uh, the diagonals here. One diagonal, the other diagonal. This square really ought to be rotated a little bit. My diagram was just sort of hand drawn, so it's not uh, as best as it could be. But the conclusion is that this parallelogram has the additional property that its sides are mutually perpendicular and the diagonals are also perpendicular, so this thing is a square. Okay, and we've used all the aspects of the drawing. We've used the fact that P is on this circle and on this circle, and that this is basically the horizon. This plane is parallel to this plane. Now, the actual statement of the problem is really in terms of perspectivity from the square. So if we have this quadrilateral, A, B, C, D, and we want to cook up a square, well, we just make this diagram, we place P wherever we, it is according to these circles, we create this square here, and then the perspective image of this square from the point P will be this quadrilateral A, B, C, D. And it's a completely uh, general argument. Lovely. Now, now, there's a few additional sort of questions that are naturally uh, floating around here. One of them is, how do we actually make this diagram correctly? So, suppose we have A, B, C, D to start with, and we've cooked up its vanishing points and diagonal points and these circles. We've got point P here. And then we're interested in you know, creating this, this square down here. We want to draw it just like I've drawn it here, right? But you, you can see that I just sort of did it roughly. If I actually have a situation like this, uh, and I fixed a, an angle, so that this is at some angle, it doesn't have to be perpendicular, but, but this plane and this plane are parallel, then I have to figure out, well, the line from P through B, where does it actually come out? I should be able to do better than just sort of eyeballing it like this, right? There should be some uh, actual mechanical process of actually finding that point. So that's what this problem asks. Um, how do we actually draw explicitly this square accurately and how much freedom is there? So for example, if I change the angle between our image plane and these parallel planes, does that affect the position of this image square and if so, how? That's quite interesting. Now here's another problem which is maybe suggested by this uh, line of thinking. In the affine plane, suppose we only have the ability to draw straight edges and right angles. So maybe we have a T-junction like this, kind of like a draftsman's tool, or maybe a carpenter's uh, tool like this. So we're able to draw perpendiculars from lines, and we're able to do straight edges. But we're not able to you know, specify distances and move distances around. So we're only allowed to make straight edges and draw perpendiculars. Can we construct from that a square. So there's no compass around, just this tool. So it's not too hard to see that you could easily make a rectangle, you just make some perpendicularities and you have a rectangle. But how do you ensure that you also arrange that the diagonals are perpendicular? This is interesting because Checking that somebody has made a square, that you can do with this instrument relatively easily. You just 
check that you've got perpendicularities at all of the four corners, and in addition that these two diagonals are perpendicular. So you just use your tool to check that. So checking that a given quadrilateral actually is a square is straightforward. But how do you construct a square from scratch using just this? And is it possible? Maybe it's not possible. So actually, I don't know the solution to this problem. So if any of you do, or you can figure it out, please let me know. So this is a nice problem that we've been talking about. It has a very pleasant solution uh, that I've shown you. And this is actually a solution, you know, that you could use in practice, um, perhaps for designing games, or even if you're an artist, something like this. But there is a, another question around here, which is to look at this question from a, a pure mathematics point of view. So we can ask the question, what about a pure mathematical analysis? Is there something more that we have to do if we want to establish this construction purely mathematically? And actually there are. There's various number theoretical questions or maybe assumptions that we have to inquire into. And to understand that, I want to have a very brief but important discussion where I talk about, you know, the difference between sort of classical Euclidean geometry and more modern analytic geometry. So for thousands of years, geometry was more or less Euclid's geometry. Geometry built very much on physical constructions, diagrams that you could actually make, and ultimately about properties of objects as you move them around in the plane. Then in the 17th century, we had the great revolution of Descartes and, and also Fermat, where geometry became more analytic. It ultimately became sort of dependent on a prior number theoretical framework. So these days we have Cartesian coordinates. We can specify points and lines in terms of numbers. We can specify curves by equations. There is a difference between these two geometry is a bit of a tension which there has been in geometry for quite a few centuries now and it's it's figuring here this is a, in the direction of the question i'm asking so in the very first theorem of book one of euclid he asks how do you construct an equilateral triangle on a given base and what you do he says is well you construct a circle centered at one through the other like this and then you create another circle centered at the other point through the first point. Okay, not very good, but anyway, and then you get this point here. Actually, there's two of them, but you choose one of them there. And then you just join the, the points to get an equilateral triangle. Now that's all well and good. Um, but in recent centuries, people have realized that there's a a small or maybe not so small logical problem with this, which is that how do you know that these two circles that you have drawn actually meet in a point or in actually two points? How do you know that? So that's not actually one of Euclid's axioms. He does not assume that and he does not prove that either. After all, if you draw two general circles, they don't necessarily have to intersect. So it's a property of the relative positions of them. Now, the corresponding thing in analytic geometry has a quite a different form. If you had to create a, a triangle or an equilateral triangle, say, on a given base, you still could do the same kind of thinking, but you could do it all algebraically. So this first circle here, that would then be some quadratic equation. And this second circle would be another quadratic equation. So you have these two quadratic equations. And then to find this third point or one of these two points, to get the equilateral triangle is a question of solving these, these two e equations. So you're looking for a common solution and that becomes a number theoretical problem. In other words, it depends really on assumptions about the underlying numerical system that we're using. This is not really visible in Euclid's geometry, but it's very much a part of Descartes' geometry because it's obviously dependent on a prior numerical system. So it could be that the answers to geometrical questions depend on the nature of the underlying numerical system that you're starting with. 
Now, this is becoming very much more in focus in recent decades, where people have been looking more and more at geometries over finite fields, where you basically take the Cartesian point of view and say, okay, what happens if we replace the rational numbers or the real numbers or the complex numbers, whatever system that we're using here, with a finite field? Okay, well, then everything is very cut and dried, but in particular, answers to questions like this become dependent on which field you're working over. Okay, so the, uh, the kind of let's say, geometrical intuition that most undergraduates have, that you, you have some curve like this given by some equation, and you have some other curve given by some other equation, that if it appears as if they have solutions, then they do have common solutions. That is more open to question now, because it's really a, a, an issue of what the underlying field is. Okay. Now, in, in classical courses, we usually take the real numbers to be the underlying field, okay? And the real numbers, it's a very pleasant situation in some sense because if two curves look like they have solutions, then they do have solutions typically. But unfortunately, this requires a disconnect with our computational reality. So our computers cannot verify what we're doing here, really. But I, of course, am highly skeptical about the validity of the arithmetic of real numbers. So I would like to, you know, to look at these things from a more, uh, a bigger point of view and ask, what happens if you look at a, a general field? You know, what can we say over a general field? Well, then all these kinds of questions uh, have a number theoretical aspect. And in particular, the question that we've been looking at the perspective image of a square, will have a number theoretical aspect. Because, crucially, exactly this kind of diagram was involved, as you saw, right? We had these two circles, and we were intersecting them to find the point of perspectivity. So, it's legitimate for us to ask, well, under what conditions can we actually ensure that such a point of perspectivity actually does exist in the numerical system that we've chosen, whatever it is? So that both enlarges our problem and brings in a number theoretical aspect and requires some more delicate analysis. We'll be looking at that in our next video. I hope you'll join me for that. I'm Norman Wahlberger. Thanks for listening.